relaxation. Uh, children's over regularization which is one of the examples he has included in the book and I have included in the slide as well so we'll go over that. Uh, Ernest Davis is a professor currently a professor at NYU. Uh, his current research is about representing common sense knowledge reasoning and, and so on. So he has a lot of materials put together and it is available in his website as well so it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, so uh, the book actually in total consists of eight chapters where the first five talks about the limitations on the issues with the current AI systems. And the last three talks about uh, the insights that we can gain from human mind and how can we implement that into the solution. The last three chapters alone about 100 pages. So I won't be able to complete the entire book in one presentation. So I have divided this into two presentations. Uh, so I'll go over the presentation now. Um, yeah. So the book is about the book talks about the evolution of AI where, from the Rosenblatt perceptron to the current deep learning models and also the uh, parallel of uh, the classical AI models from uh, decision trees to SVMs and how that eventually now got merged into deep learning models as well. Uh, and then it talks about the limitations of mission and deep learning models. Uh, it specifically talks about how the big data ca alone can't solve the problem because most of the current mission and deep learning models do rely on big data and no data perfectly reflects this ever-changing world and uh, that is it, it's practically not possible and that is the that is one of the main reason that we can't just rely on the big data alone in author's own words this book will uh, the, bu the book will be a diagnosis of where we are stuck and a prescription of how we might do better the first chapter talks about uh, my the first chapter talks about the gap uh, uh so Devati, did they talk about this uh, ellipse something more than what you just showed? Uh, as the ellipse? Yeah, I mean, this one, two, three that they have on the right hand side. Uh, so he just gives an overview of uh, what, in general, the artificial intelligence is, which is both uh, the machine deep learning models and also the the classical AI techniques such as decision trees and uh, also knowledge graphs and, and, and so on. And then what is machine learning? And then comes, and inside that is what we have deep learning. And uh, and we currently are majorly focusing on only one aspect of artificial intelligence and trying to achieve the artificial intelligence just using the deep learning models. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, I've seen this uh, used by other people also. Um, my point, the point I would have made if I was doing this is to, uh, bring in explicitly um, uh, both data and knowledge and hybrid AI. Um, right, right. And um, I mean, yeah, you can put that under artificial intelligence kind of thing, but there is something specific to be said here where your computation is not only reliant on data and uh, some um, low le uh, level of uh, representational knowledge through the taxonomy that you use for training data but uh, more comprehensive knowledge. And I would put, make that as a, uh, you know, concrete part because evolving very well. Uh, actually, the rest of the book mostly talks about that. Once okay. we talk about uh, the limitations of AI, actually the solution that he's proposing is uh, mostly about what we are working on using rules, abstractions, and relationships to reason about the output uh, that we get from the AI models mm -hmm. and how can we merge these two together. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I think that will become more evident and more stronger in the rest of the slides. Uh, so the author has talked about various examples for each of the chapters. I won't be able to present every single example. So I've tried my best to uh, give the gist of each of the chapters, what each chapter talks about. So the first chapter is called Mind the Gap. Uh, it talks about three major gap. The first one is the gullibility gap. So we attribute missions to intelligence because computers can do fast computation, but that is not intelligence. So it's fast computation. Yes, missions 
won't make mistake when we when we ask the machines to perform complex mathematical operations. Uh, we also tend to say that machines don't lie. Yes, they may not lie, but in case of AI, we can't really say that they are telling the truth and, and telling the truth every single time. So the author calls this fundamental over attribution error. So since we think the missions are intelligent, we also tend to think uh, the chatbots or the assistants that we have are also more intelligent than us. Uh, some people have, uh, there were some experiments conducted where some people's people did not realize that they were talking about talking to a chatbot uh, in, in some situations in some context. And the second one is the illusory progress gap. So mistaking progress or progress in AI on easy problems for progress on hard problems. Uh, the very good example is uh, AlphaGo. Uh, the AI model that was developed for AlphaGo uh, defeated the world champion. And we thought that AlphaGo is one of the complex games. And if we have developed an AI model to solve uh, or AI model that can uh, win against a human champion who plays in AlphaGo, so then we, we are very close to solving some of the most complex problems in the world. But the thing is, AlphaGo is a closed system. There are only so many possible combinations and only so many possible moves that one can make. Uh, so when we compare AlphaGo against, let's let's take autonomous driving, there are so many possible things that can make that can happen. I mean, when we are driving, we ourselves come across so many edge cases, but we are just equipped to uh, act in those edge cases without having seen the previous training data or having seen that uh, situation before. And the next one is the robustness. Gap. So the proposed approaches work only sometimes or on some inputs. Uh, the classic example is the stop sign, which we all know about. So a mission that is trained on uh, the stop sign, which is on the right, actually predicted the stop sign on the, sorry, mission that is trained on the stop, the stop sign, which is on the left, actually predicted the stop sign on the right as a refrigerator with stickers on it. The author says that there are five fundamental ways currently where the users differ from the current AI models. Uh, the first one is we understand language. The missions that we currently have can draw correlation amongst the words and the sentences, but they do not understand language. And the second is we understand world. And the third is we can easily adapt uh, uh, we can adapt flexibly to new circumstances. When we are put in an un uh, put in a new uncomfortable zone, we we bring in the skills that we have to try our best to survive or get over that uncomfortable zone. And the fourth is we learn new things quickly. We do not need hundred examples of apple or hundred examples of mango to understand what is in an apple, what is a mango. We just need one picture and we can classify hundred pictures of mango or even thousand pictures of mango and apples, mangoes and apples. And the last one is reason in the face of incomplete and even inconsistent information. Uh, one of the best examples for this could be Every single child did not go and touch the fire to understand that it is going to burn our fingers. We may not know the exact consequence of it, which is the burn, but we as a child, we know that touching that is going to hurt us. We may not know how, but we know that it is going to hurt. Of course, some child children actually went and touched the fire to learn that it should not be touched again, but most of us knew, knew that it is going to hurt us in some way and we do not go and touch the fire. And the next chapter talks about what is at stake. The facial recognition system in China, it sent a, a jaywalking ticket to one of the famous entrepreneur uh, because a picture of the entrepreneur was on the bus as an advertisement. The facial recognition system thought that that particular person was actually jaywalking when there is no walking sign, but it was just a picture of the person on the bus. And one other example uh, was uh, 
what is called as Emilia Bedelia problem. So the character Emilia Bedelia was a servant in our children's book where the particular servant takes the request of the employers too literally. So if we have robots which can at least obey the commands or perform the commands that we give them, the intelligence of those robots will be, if we rely only on the big data, the intelligence level of those robots will be, let's say that we give a command tag, take everything in the living room and put it away in the closet. We will only come back to home to find that the robot taking every single item in the living room, chop it into pieces to make it fit in the closet. The nine problems, uh, the nine problems that actually concerns the author and the author talks about is the following. The first is the fundamental over attribution error, which we just saw on the previous slide, and also lack of robustness, where we saw an example of the stop sign. And the third is depend, depending uh, on large training sets to learn from it. We know that the world isn't ever the world is an ever-changing uh, entity. There is, there can't be a data set which can perfectly capture this ever-changing world. So every single one of us has to constantly work on that data set to tell us what is changing in and around us in order to create such a data set, which is actually not feasible. And the fourth one is blind data dredging, which is called, which is, blind data cleaning. So when we blindly start cleaning the data, do the data annotation, uh, the results can be nasty. So one of the nastiest example was that in 2015, the Google Photos labeled African Americans as gorillas, which is extremely insensible and uh, humiliating. And in 2016, the Google image search, one of the people found that the Google image search for professional hairstylists only returned images of white women, which is not good. And the fifth one is perinaceous echo chamber effect. So it was recently discovered that the 50% of the web documents uh, where we can find corresponding documents for each of the languages. So for example, if we find uh, a document in English, and we also find a corresponding uh, translated document in French. So 50% of such documents were actually created by missions. We, in turn, what we do is we go to the web, scrape the data for uh, data to train the mission translation algorithms and use that data to train our uh, mission translation models. And I don't think I, here I have to explain the consequences of what that could be. The result of this translation is going to be extremely poor. And the sixth one is public data manipulation. So if you're going to use the data that can be publicly manipulated, again, the results are going to be poor. So one, uh, one example, one funny example, which recently happened was that with Google search, if people can create a lot of posts, we can associate a search term with a particular result or a particular entity. In 2018, people managed to match the search term idiot uh, with Donald Trump, with pictures or links of Donald Trump. So if you're going to use such data to train our models, we know what is going to happen. And the seventh one is uh, pre-existing social bias. So historically in some cities and some countries, um, some of the policies uh, which, were, which was curated like probably 100 years ago uh, can still be biased against some minority groups. And if you're going to use that data to deploy it, to that data to train the models and deploy it into uh, law enforcement systems, it is only going to amplify the bias. Uh, the book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Cathy O'Neill, uh, it talks very nicely about it. Uh, that's one of the other books that I'm currently reading as well. And uh, the eighth one is, it's very easy for the AI models to end up with wrong goals. Uh, one example was that uh, a soccer playing robot was encouraged to uh, touch the ball as much as possible. So the robot found a way to just stand next to the ball and start vibrating. So it achieved the goal we gave it, but not for the purpose we asked the robot to do. 
And one other uh, example, which was very interesting to me was a group of farmers, uh, a group of farmers hired a bunch of machine learning engineers to train a machine learning or a deep learning model to identify whether the curve is, whether the cow is in a estrous cycle or not on an any given day. So the cow undergoes estrous cycle for 21 days and on one day, uh, sorry, the cow undergoes a uh, non-estrous cycle for 21 days and on one day it will be on estrous cycle. The model achieved 95% accuracy and the farmers were very happy about it. But when the machine learning model was deployed, they found out that it marked every single day as the cow was in a non-estrous cycle. So for the 21 days, it predicted it right. And on the day it is supposed to be in estrous cycle, it also predicted it as non-estrous cycle. Uh, the cow was in a non-estrous cycle and it achieved 95% accuracy. So the machine learning model achieved 95% accuracy, but totally failed the purpose that the model was trained for. So this also says that accuracy does not mean anything or everything. Sorry, the accuracy does not mean everything. Uh, I take that back. Uh, and the ninth point is that the places where we try to deploy AI is at a large scale. So one teeny tiny mistake could be amplified. So the example that we saw was uh, the Pyrenees echo chamber effect where uh, a, one policy that is biased against minority group when we when we deploy it in law enforcement areas it is going to amplify that bias drastically so the model of this particular chapter is wherever we want to go with the ai models we can't go there with just big data alone a lot can go wrong if we put blind faith in big data as per kathy, uh, kathy o'neill and uh, the next chapter talks about deep learning and beyond. So this particular chapter gives a little bit about uh, the evolution of AI as well, but most of us already know, I wanted to focus on the, the other interesting areas. So the author lists three main um, annoying features of deep learning. So deep learning is greedy, deep learning is opaque, deep learning is brittle. So the first one, greedy, uh, we know that we are all uh, fascinated by AlphaGo, but it took 30 million game simulations for the AlphaGo to reach superhuman performance. And the second one is something that we commonly talk about. Uh, deep learning models are black box models. They are opaque. So we don't know why the network is making the mistake. So for example, when we go to... Uh, when we go to a hospital and we get a prescription, we are also given the list of side effects if you are going to take that particular medication. So if I'm going to take a deep learning model, a facial recognition system and uh, give it to police officers, I cannot really tell the police officers the list of situation where this particular deep learning model works and the list of situation where this particular deep learning model won't work. And the last one is deep learning model is very brittle. So it has trouble recognizing ordinary objects and unusual forces. So when uh, we saw a truck like this got into an accident and parked the corner of the road, since it's a white colored truck, the model predicts it as a snow heap, but clearly that is not a snow heap. If we go and hit into the truck, we are going to be extremely hurt. Whereas if we go and hit into a snow heap of that size, probably, the FX won't be that detrimental. And the picture on the left is a la latte art of football on it, but the model predicts it as a football. We do not really want to go and kick that particular ball there. And uh, the next chapter talks about if the computers are so smart, like we think they are, why can't they read? And one particular a uh, question the author put there was very interesting to me. That was very interesting to me was, what are the seven horcruxes in an Harry Potter? When this was asked to a language model, the result was not even in the form of a list. It was a random paragraph from uh, random, uh, random letters or paragraphs put, random sentences put together as a paragraph from the Harry Potter book. So if you take a, take a look at the, a, sh a short snippet of an incident here. Uh, Almanzo turned to Mr. Thompson and asked, did you lose your wallet? 
Mr. Thompson slapped his pocket and answered, yes, I have. So Almanzo asked, is this is it? <clears throat> Mr. Thompson replied, yes, yes, that is it. And then he breathed a sigh of relief after checking his wallet. Well, this darn guy, uh, darn boy did not steal any of it. So if we give this particular uh, input to the machine learning model or a deep learning model and ask the following questions, we are not able to get a right answer to any one of these questions because there is no correspondence between the structure or uh, structure of a uh, structure between the questions and the answers. So the first question, why did Mr. Thompson slap his pocket with his hand? We can, of course, answer. So before Almanza spoke, did Mr. Thompson realize that he had lost his wallet? Of course, no. And we can answer it again. Missions could not. Uh, what is Almanzo referring to when he asks, is this is it? And again, we know because we know the context, but the deep learning or the machine learning models, the language models did not know. The fourth one is a very interesting one. Who almost lost $1,500? The, the, that particular figure is not mentioned anywhere in the story, $1,500. But we humans can connect that. Mr. Thompson is the one who almost lost his wallet. Uh, if we, if the question is asked, who almost lost thousand five hundred dollars, we can make the connections and clearly answer that it is Mr. Thompson. And the fifth question is, was all of the money still in the wallet? So it did not clearly mention if all of the money was in the wallet, but it is indirectly referred as didn't steal any of it. The missions could not, of course, answer. So the current end-to-end -end systems that we have, the end-to-end -end learning systems that we have uh, is not so successful in uh, when it comes to language modeling. But there was one particular area where we have seen uh, accepted success or an accepted, accepted performance. So that is a Google Translate. So that one is a Google Translate model. But again, with Google Translate, it did very well for English and French because the correspondence between English and French word is quite similar and we can find more relevant data for English and English to French translation. Uh, for example, if we take the Canadian constitution documents, we have a properly human curated constitution documents, both in English and French. So we know for sure that these correspondences are right and it is generated by humans. So it is reasons like this where we can find uh, more relevant data. And since the correspondence between English and French words are quite similar, the Google Translate between English and French words are quite successful. It can be successful in other languages where the correspondence is similar and relevant data can be found. But in my opinion, when I searched for uh, Google Translate between English and Tamil, which is my mother tongue, it was actually doing very bad. It did well for very obvious uh, translations, but not for the inexplicit ones. Uh, uh, also, so uh, as we kind of find in analogy uh, mm -hmm. work uh, and in that, uh, uh, you know, uh, stack that we made up uh we're doing uh right. words and sentences things uh look look better if you uh, try to do it on a broader level and want to retain the whole thing like whole paragraph map mapping and whole document mapping uh it won't do that well right right uh that uh, yeah, actually, that is true because it does not understand the compositionality between, uh, sorry, uh, compos compositionality behind the sentences and the document or even the paragraphs. And the flow and the argument building and all the other things that happen when you uh, construct um, a good text. True. Uh, the current, unless otherwise we actually explicitly turn, uh, learn, I mean, uh, train this language models as this particular sentence talks about an argument, this particular sentence is a factual. The current language models by in itself can't classify those as well. Uh, so the author, the author puts a question. So if a system, if an end-to-end -end system has worked so well for uh, a translation purposes, why is it not work, working well for Q&A? Just we, as we saw in the previous slide, the in case of question and answers, the questions bear no obvious relation to the words in the text. So the fourth example, who almost lost $1,500? So we did not even see the word $1,500. So in those situations, it suffers. 
And we can't really curate a data uh, of all possible questions one might ask and all possible answers to those questions. And that obviously is the reason that with respect to question and answers, the 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 AI mo the language models are very limited. They can perform in a particular situation or in a particular context, but not uh, in a generalized way. And uh, the next chapter talks about uh, robots and robotics. So the author has named this particular chapter as Where is Rosie? Rosie is a domestic robot, a fictional character in a TV series called Jetsons. This particular Rosie robot uh, performs all the domestic chores, takes care of the babies, cleaning, taking care of the house, uh, does basically everything for uh, the humans. But are they close to those robots anywhere nearby? No. Uh, so the current limitations of the AI, uh, so the current limitations of those robots, the author puts it in a, a very satirical way. So let's say that uh, the robots, there are a bunch of robots or one or two robots trying to come and attack you. All you have to do is just the following to escape from it. First one is close the doors. Most of the robots has difficulty with doorknobs because each of the doorknobs are very different. So they are not really trained on all the doorknobs or how to use all the doorknobs. And the second one is paint the doorknob as the same color as to the door. It camouflages nicely and the robot won't even be able to detect it because the doorknobs that the robots have already seen is usually a different color from the door. And the third one is put a poster of school bus on your door. The robot will get confused as to whether that is a poster of school bus on the door or whether that is a, whether that is a school bus which is in the way of the robot. And uh, the fourth one is hop on a table. So most robots are, the most robots for, trained for the domestic purposes are trained to climb the stairs, but not to climb on a table. Unless otherwise we take a robot and particularly train it or specifically for the task of uh, climbing to a, ra a loft or something to pick something up, they are not learned to uh, climb unusual objects. And the final thing is if none of, that works just keep distracting the robot and the battery will run out eventually because the current the battery system of current robots do not last very long they need uh charging quite often so that that gives an overall picture of where we are currently with the robots the domestic robots and uh i'll ask a question so according to the author he said this is the uh best current selling version of domestic robot we have. Uh, can anybody guess what would be the current best selling of domestic robot? Roomba? Yes, you're right. Roomba is the current best selling version of domestic robot we have, which is a vacuum cleaner. Uh, so we are nowhere near to having a Rusi, uh, like we saw in the TV series, Jetsons. So outside of factories and warehouses, robots are still a curiosity because every single household is different. But in case of warehouses and factories, the interiors are, there is not much change in the environment. So it's rows of uh, stacked cardboard boxes that they can go around and navigate. Uh, we might see a video of a uh, video of so many recreational drones doing so great tracking hikers, uh, taking picture using drones for taking nice pictures. But the keyword there is demo. So that's a prototype and it does well on the demo, but not in all general uh, situations. Uh, the author also mentions one good usage of robot that we have seen in the past uh, was that when the nuclear reactor in the Japan was destroyed in 2001 tsunami, uh, Japanese used robots to go and uh, use robots to clean the nuclear reactor. So of course, for those robots, humans were uh, sitting somewhere and operating the robots, but they did, uh, the robots were in a good condition. The electronic missions were in a good conditions to uh, navigate around the nuclear reactor to clean the nuclear reactor. So the robots currently do need human brains behind them to operate. 
uh, but we we can say that we have a version of robots which we humans can operate and navigate around. So throughout or up until these chapters, one thing was very evident. What was missing throughout was common sense. Unfortunately, acquiring this common sense for the general world is difficult. Uh, the author says how we can go about it and what are the potential uh, ways how we can go and learn about it. So my key takeaways up until this point was the core of the deep learning models is correlation. The deep learning models can learn patterns well. So for example, if we employ a deep learning model in a tile sorting industry where it produces only X number of tiles and it has no, no plans to include new designs of the tiles and under uh, right uh, lighting conditions and, or the lighting conditions are going to remain the same, it will do a pretty, it will do a pretty good job. And it will do a pretty good job, but the world knowledge is not about patterns. For example, if you take understanding sarcasm, it's not about understanding patterns. There is so much more to it. And the other thing is only with one modality, the system can't learn much. And only with one type of system, the AI cannot learn much. Like we cannot reach AI. And with the deep learning models, the problem is with representations rather than with learning. So we have so many learning algorithms, the gradient boosting algorithms to learn, to tune the parameters. But the representations that we have, that we are proposing the vector representations can be capture useful information uh, or in other words, the information that we want it to capture. So now uh, let's see how we can take insights from the human mind and how can that be utilized? Rivthi? Uh, yes, Dr. Bipla. Yeah, quick question. Did they talk about a RoboCup? Uh, no, I, I also thought about that. Uh, the Mars rovers, right? No, no, no. no RoboCup. No. RoboCup is a competition oh. for almost 20, 25 years, 25 years actually, Okay. of uh, robots playing uh, soccer together. And uh, I see. Okay. And they have um, actually graduated a lot. Uh -huh. And starting with the um, first competitions where they would just stand. So essentially the problem is you have robots that are trying to play a soccer and maximize their score, right? So it's collaboration, uh -huh. looking at the uh, environment and then perceiving. A lot of improvement has happened. So I was just curious. Oh, I see. Actually, they did not talk about the RoboCup. Uh, only one one of that particular example was drawn where uh, a robot was asked to maximize the number of times it touches the ball. So it just stood next to a ball and started vibrating. Uh, so to maximize the number of touches. So only that particular example was given, but uh, but it was not, but the book did not talk in detail about the robo car. Okay, this is the most prominent. Um use case of uh, of robots in gaming outside of military or any, anywhere else. Thanks. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that, Dr. Duplo. I'll, I'll also read about it. Let's we get a pause, uh, just in reality, for a quick pointer, if you just go back to the PPT. PPT4 and Palm, both are doing excellent in sarcasm uh, explanation. I mean, I, the same question I asked to Professor Pushpak when mm -hmm. he was presenting. So if you look at the last one year, there's a you know huge development, and one modality, two modality, I believe Dali and Diffusion are doing you know excellent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we we might discuss about this at the very end, but let let's go. Oh, okay, uh, okay, got it. Uh, so now moving on to the chapter insights from the human mind. Uh, human mind. So this involves a little bit of. Uh, the observations that we learned from uh, cognitive psychology and how uh, so far we have used some of that in AI for mission and deep learning models and how a lot of uh, how a lot is left for us to be decided uh, uh, for us to be learned uh, so that will be the theme of this particular chapter so the first one is uh, there are no silver bullets um, uh, so the first one is uh, behaviorism 
So the uh, scientist named John Watson from John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University claimed that uh, he could raise any child to be anything by carefully controlling their environment. In other words, he says that humans only learn based on reward and punishment they receive from the environment, uh, which actually is the basis of RL algorithms that we have. But that does not explain how we understand a line of a dialogue or how we figure out how to use a nail and a hammer. So using a nail and a hammer to a certain extent can be said that it can be a reward and punishment, but how do we understand a line of a dialogue? It does not really explain that. So the author says that there is no single master algorithm to solve intelligence. So no, we... People don't learn a nail and hammer through the reward system because uh, in, in the sense that people don't let the uh, hammer uh, hit their hit uh, fingers, uh, you know, they uh, mostly get by um, and they don't need that feedback to, uh, you know, even if their hammer uh, hits the uh, finger, it is by mistake uh, from the very start. So right, right. They don't know. I don't think that anybody wants even a single experience of, uh, uh, you know, uh, hammer hitting the finger. Uh, before learning uh, what to try in terms of hitting the nail? Uh, certainly. So I just said it to a certain extent because one has to just learn that we have to hold the nail else it will drop. That's it. Like mm. a very teeny tiny bit extent, but not mm. completely. So uh, the, uh, the, the overall point is that, so we are saying that behaviorism can uh, uh, help us raise a, a child to be anything based on uh, how we control their environment, but there is no single master algorithm to uh, to achieve intelligence or to solve intelligence. So true intelligence systems are likely to be complex and also flexible like our brain. And the second uh, the second topic is cognition uses internal representation. So when we learn a language, it is not based on the external environment, but based on the internal grammar, which we also call as internal representation. So this internal grammar is actually different for each of us. So even if we take a people, people who learn English as a second language, the internal grammar of how we understand the language is actually dependent on how we learn our mother tongue. So it changes for every individual, it changes for uh, every group of people too. So what is missing in the mission, uh, the deep learning models, internal representations is prepositions uh, as, called, uh, as called by cognitive psychologists, which describes the relationship between entities. So current deep learning model, if we take these relationships and entities, or if we take these words, pass it on to the deep learning model, what it does is it approximates. It, approx it approximates the meaning of the word. So when we train a word to work, to take these words and give it to a machine learning, or even if we take uh, any graphs and feed it into the machine learning model, it is eventually whatever the vector that we are getting it out is an approximation of the fact that we just fed into the model. So it predicts the results with the confidence scores, right? So once our facts are fuzzy, once we have approximated our facts, how can we get the reasoning right? So once our facts are fuzzy, it's really hard to get the reasoning right. So the fundamental problem in deep learning is not about the learning, it is actually about the representations. And the next insight is abstraction and generaliz generalization. So we use a lot of abstraction and generalization to learn. So for example, this was a particular example uh, that happened in Gary Marcus's house. So his child, Alexander, when he was about five and a half years old, he was asking uh, Gary, what is chest deep water? Uh, his mom answered that chest deep water is a water that comes up to your chest. And his father said that it is different for each person. Chest deep for me is higher than what it would be for you. And uh, the child made following inference. So chest deep for you is head deep for me. The word head deep was not mentioned anywhere or even taught to the kid by the parent, but the child realized that chest deep for his father would be head deep for himself. So the abstraction is the chest deep for you is the head deep for me. And the child generalized that different 
it's different for each person and the kid actually learned that so what is uh, chest deep for his father is going to be uh, head deep for him or it can it can even be neck deep for someone else so the representations that we get from the mission and deep learning models do not have the uh, do not have the common sense or uh, or to put it in other, uh, the representations that underlie both the cognitive models and common sense are built on the rich collection of abstract relations combined in complex structures. The current representations of the deep learning models, we do not have that. The representations in the deep learning models do not capture that, but they are good at capturing the correlations and they stop right there. The next insight is the cognitive systems are highly structured, just the author made a comment in the previous section. So when we take the AlphaGo model, which achieved the superhuman performance and uh, won against a uh, national champion, uh, sorry, the, cha the AlphaGo champion, it used two models, not one particular model. So one was deep learning model. The other one was Monte, Monte Carlo tree search. So the AI, like the mind, must be structured with different kinds of tools for different kinds of, uh, sorry, different aspects of complex problems. And the next section is even the simplest aspect of cognition require multiple tools. So uh, this was Gary Marcus's dissertation. So even at a fine grain level, the cognitive machinery is composed not of single mechanism, but multiple mechanism. So let's take the past tense. So there are two kinds of past tenses. One is the regular past tense. The other one is irregular past tense. The regular past tense is walk, walked, talk, talked. You basically add ed to the end of the uh, end of the word, and that is the regular past tense. So the irregular past tense are the past tense is completely different from the present tense of the word bring, brought, go, went. So they tested this on the child, and when they when the data was analyzed. So the author did not mention what data was analyzed, whether the brain signals were analyzed or they used a bunch of questions to analyze it. Uh, but when the data was analyzed, they realized that the regular verbs were generalized by the rules, meaning that if we give a verb, if we give a ver verb that the child has not seen before, they were still able to generalize it by just adding ed to the end of the word. Whereas the irregular verbs produced are produced through the associative network of the uh, mind. So the regular verbs can generalize with just few pieces of the data, whereas the irregular verbs leverage the memory. So we, right now in deep learning, we use the generalized ge models for generalization, but we also need the models that take, that make use of the memory or the knowledge that has already fed into it. So these two systems actually coexist and complement each other. So when we take <clears throat> image recognition models, we use deep learning to perform image recognition. It is good at image recognition, but it is not good at reasoning. So there we have to use uh, the classical AI approaches such as which includes the rules and abstraction to reason it. So these two systems need to coexist and we need to find a way to properly combine it uh, to achieve or come close to or solving intelligence and using uh, using AI, sorry, uh, and also making AI models transparent and eventually trustworthy as well. The next chapter is human thought and languages are compositional. So Verto Weg uh, performs very well with words. So it works very well for words in most cases, but not for sentences. So the classic example of king versus queen to man versus women. Uh, uh, and also uh, if we take country versus capital, those examples are really good. But when we put together our sentences and we try to train uh, one other model on top of it for the sentences, it do not capture uh, a, do not capture a lot of it. So, for example, if we take the if we take a sentiment uh, analyzer or a sentiment classification model, uh, the following example: loved it until I hated it is more of a negative sentiment. 
hated it until I loved it is more of a positive sentiment. But when we try to calculate the cosine similarity between these two words, they are very closely placed in the latent space because both of these sentences share uh, almost the same words. And I think actually just the same words. These two share just the same words and they are uh, placed close in the latent space. Whereas one is a positive sentiment, the other is a negative sentiment. And if we take another example, a book is on the table versus a table that is on a book, almost share a common word, common words. But if we take a look at, if we are about to draw a composition behind each of these sentences, only then we can actually understand the language. So human thought and language are compositional. So if we take a look at the figure here, a book that is on the table, if we draw a syntax tree to understand the thought and the composition behind this particular sentence, it goes like this, a determiner, a noun, a coordination, conjunction, a verb, preposition, determiner, and a noun. So these two are noun phase, prepositional phase, verb phase, relative clause, and noun phrase, everything put together where noun phase is the root. But if we do the, if we perform the same, uh, compositional tree or if we draw the same syntax tree for the other word, a table that is on the book, the tree is going to be slightly different, even though the words are almost the same. So it is the underlying composition that is going to help us differentiate. So we need to start thinking about uh, training or using machine or deep learning models that understands these compositions. So uh, Revathi, uh, have you read the KI bot paper? Uh, yes, Dr. Shay. Well, the, we we give examples just similar to this yes. and uh, show how KI bot exactly addresses this issue. These issues, right, right. Uh, we already, uh, so as I was mentioning before, so most of what is mentioned in this chapter, insights from the human brain uh, are already the areas we are trying to head towards or already working on it. Uh, and uh, thankfully, a... Uh, um, a follow on to that, we, we had a uh, KIBOT paper, did, uh, you know, the KIBOT paper itself was not um, accepted because the reviewer wanted, uh, you know, us to train um, on a, you know, much, much larger corpus and show. Uh, it's we, we showed that that a small base model uh, uh, beats the large model, uh, existing large model, but that was not good enough for him and he wanted us to uh, you know, train a large model that would have costed um, million dollars plus, which we did not have. Uh, right. But anyway, um, the following paper, TLDR, mm -hmm. uh, is accepted right now at, uh, as a short paper. I would really like to get that um, as a, a full-size paper also. But I think the core idea are, are now, uh, you know, going to be published in this accepted paper. Uh, right. Actually, that's one of the places where I'm facing issue as well, they need more evaluation. So everything mm. boils down to that accuracy and numbers. Mm. But I just presented an example before, accuracy does not mean everything. Mm. So yeah. And uh, the next section talks about top-down models and bottom-up models. Uh, so let's start by uh, this. So if you look at the figure, is that a letter B or a numeral 13? Some of us might answer it's a letter B. Some of us might answer that it's a numeral 13. But the right answer is it depends on the context. So it can be, sorry, it can be A, B, C or 12, 13, 14. The interpretation of this number is depends on the context. So the context actually plays a very big role in uh, resolution of ambiguity. Uh, the pixels on their own makes little sense. So it needs, we need to give more context to it. And one of the interesting uh, thing the author presented was, which I did not think about it before. Our moral judgments also depends on the context. So if we hear that someone stole something, we are immediately like, oh my God, that is bad. But there is, but if we say that, oh, a homeless person probably steal the banana from the shop, you will be like, I think that is okay. We can let it go. But if you hear about a burglary where tons of money or uh, valuables were stolen, we are immediately appalled. And uh, same with the killing. So if we see a murder in a movie, we, we do not take that well. Versus when we see someone killing someone else as a revenge in the movie, the audiences usually applaud and whistle in the theater. 
so our moral judgment judgments also very well depends on the context behind each of these incidents and one other interesting example that was presented in the book which i really liked was the following so the figure that we see in the center uh, the list of symbols that we see in the center was given to one group of people with the label uh, listed on the left hand side, the label list one, uh, curtains in a window, crescent moon, eyeglasses, seven and ship's wheel. And then the users were asked to redraw the symbols that they just saw, that they just saw. And these were the figures drawn. And another set of people were given the same stimuli, the same set of signals, but with a different uh, uh, but with a different label set and these were the figures that were drawn by the people so if we saw the reproductions uh, uh the re the reproductions of these diagrams by one group of people whether the other uh, versus the another group of people is actually quite different but uh it, it is close to the original simile but it is quite different so even the way that we interpret these small signals sorry small symbols is very much dependent on the context whether it's a crescent moon or the letter C, it's going to go and sit in our brain completely differently. So we need both the top-down models and the bottom-up models to meet somewhere as well. Whereas the bottom-up models are pixels on their own and the top-down models are introducing context to make sense of the pixels. I'm just curious, uh, these days uh, people are, uh, I see more and more uh, papers uh, uh, in neuroscience on uh, MRI, fMRI studies about showing showing people these symbols and see what parts of parts of brain um, you know light up or or participate. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing that uh, the, you'll see different patterns uh, when um, a symbol is interpreted as one way or the other. Uh, right. The author also talked about although, that. Although it might be interesting that suppose I look at the eyeglass, uh, you know, and dumbbell the example. My mm -hmm. brain may actually um, uh, iterate over both of them. I mean, you say, and then then choose to select one of them. Uh, you know, True. so and, and it may all depend upon the other things, uh, the context. Uh, you know, other things that give me the context. And hence, it may be incredibly hard for. Um, well, maybe maybe there is a way to say that. Okay, at the end, the brain, um, you know, chose to uh, label this eyeglass uh, and not dumbbell. And, and that may be possible to automatically infer, assuming that you, we are doing real-time scanning. Uh, true. When we actually just look at the symbols, the interpretation for each of us might be different as well. When we just look mm. at the symbols, each of us interpret, us, interpret it differently as well. Uh, so the author says that so far we have identified 150 regions of brain that works in combination uh, to execute uh, different types of tasks, mm. uh, a creative task or a mundane task, and then so on. Mm. Revati, we are uh, almost towards the end of the hour. Right, right. What is uh, our plan? Just just few more slides, I think three to four, uh, mm. that will conclude. And uh, the next one is concepts are embedded in theories. So we know the concept of a pizza versus a concept of a quarter. So when the sizes are reversed, we know that the coin is not legitimate. Both are circular shaped structures, but we know that we might be able to accept a pizza in the size of a coin and we will probably be eat it. But if you paid so much money for it, we, not, we may not be able to accept uh, a pizza in the size of a quarter. But if someone is trying to pay uh, for the pizza uh, in the size of a car, with the quarter that is about the size of the pizza, we may not accept it. Uh, one other example would be uh, a robot shouldn't attempt to use a fire extinguisher when it sees a painting of a fire hung on a wall. We know the concept of painting, concept of fire and concept of fire and painting put together and hung on a wall. But uh, the current robot, which just operates based on the pixels and identifying objects, it may not know the concept. So the underlying concepts are uh, not very well known or not taught to the system. And the next one is causal relations. So the current deep learning models le learn based on correlation. And what that leads to is spurious correlation. Uh, most of us know about spurious correlation, but uh, if you have not heard of spurious correlation is uh, an example which is presented here. So the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool over the year 
correlates so positively uh, with or results in a high positive correlation with the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. It does not mean that the one influences the other. These are just two sets of numbers which happen to be following the same ups and downs over the years. Uh, the uh, There is a book on spurious correlation. There is also a website where uh, a numerous examples were presented. Uh, it's very good to go and look at it. Uh, whereas causal relations are different. So we know that the rooster crows before the sun rises, but a silencing a rooster is not going to stop the sun from rising because it's not the rooster crow. The rooster crowing and the sun rising can be correlated, uh, but we can't really try to silence the rooster and stop the sun from rising because it's a sunrise which causes the rooster crows. So the current uh, deep learning models, the representations that are generated, it captures the correlation, but not the causation. So making the deep learning models learn causation instead of correlation will be a major breakthrough, according to the author. And the next section is uh, we keep track of individual people and things, and that makes us who we are. Our environment and our experiences change based on uh, individual things that change. Uh, so for example, uh, if deep learnings are good at generalization, so it knows that kids in general prefer ice cream over vegetables, but does it know what your kid prefer? Your kid might actually prefer to have vegetables over ice creams. Uh, so it does not, it does not uh, take into account about individuals. It just talks about categories, a, a bunch of images being apple, a bunch of images being mangoes, and that's it. And deep learning can very well recognize objects, but it does not know anything about that particular uh, person that it is recognizing. So it can recognize Barack Obama, but it does not know who's Barack Obama. So it does not have a deeper sense of what the individual recognizes. So there is a our knowledge and our surrounding is so much uh, dependent on individual and the changes of each of the individual around us. And we also learn from those changes as well. And the final slide is complex cognitive creatures are in blank, blank slates. This particular, uh, the, partic the question that is put forward in this particular chapter was thought provoking to me as well. So uh, how much of the structure of the mind is already built in and how much is learned? So uh, we heard of this nature versus nurture. So nature is uh, how a human brain or our, our cells consider, we consist of, so we has a lot of chemicals, neural connections, DNA is already present in our brain. We are born with it. We still don't know how much of that is uh, influencing our learning process. And there is something called nurture, which is the learning process. So we learn from the environments, we learn from whatever we learn. So we humans have innateness, but deep learning models are dominated by blank slate. So we freshly take a neural network, uh, we randomly, uh, we randomly uh, uh, sorry, initialize the weight, and then we start the learning process. So that makes the problem harder than it should be. An analogy would be a car manufacturer trying to reinvent the wheel, uh, ignoring the past previous knowledge of vehicle rebuilding. So just trying to reinvent the wheel. So the big data plus the causal abstract knowledge can lead us towards missions with common sense. And the next chapters, the next two chapters, common sense and the path to deep understanding and trust. I'll try to present it in the next Monday meeting. And thank you. Uh, uh, any questions or concerns, uh, please go ahead. If not, I can stop sharing.